Time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News contributor Dr. Holly Phillips and Dr. Robert Gladder, an emergency physician at New York's Lenox Hill Hospital and a Forbes magazine contributor. First up, new findings from the Journal of the American Heart Association. They highlight how salt consumption can be bad for our health. Holly, tell us about this study. All right, well, Anthony, of course, we've known about a link between salt intake and high blood pressure for some time, but this study really looked at how that relationship evolves over the course of time. So they started started uh, with 4,000 people in the study who did not have high blood pressure, and they followed them for three years. At the end of the three years, 23% had developed high blood pressure. What was interesting is that people who started the study with a high salt intake were at the greatest risk of developing high blood pressure. But right behind them were people who started with a low salt intake and gradually increased it over the three years. So even that gradual increase is enough to cause hypertension in the end. It's interesting because I feel like we're always hearing about sugar instead of salt. But That's what right. is your take on how big of a problem sodium is in the U.S.? It's a real big problem. We know that 9 in 10 Americans get too much salt and that 1 in 3 of Americans actually have high blood pressure already. And high blood pressure is very bad because it leads to increased risk for stroke and heart attack, which is what we're trying to really cut down on. So, Holly, what do you do? Because, because salt is in so much food. It's not just the salt shaker. How do you curb your intake? You know, really, the biggest thing is to realize that the top source of salt or sodium in our diet isn't from the salt shaker. I have all these patients who say to me, oh, I don't get salt in my diet because I never sprinkle it on my food. But actually, 75% of the salt we take in actually comes in processed foods uh, where it's already in the food. So think things like bread, soup, pizza, uh, things where you're not adding salt to it, but those are the, the highest things, sources. Right? Yeah, a, lot of the good, a lot of the good stuff. <laughs> All right, earlier this year, the Fall Prevention Summit convened in Washington to help reduce the growing number of accidents among older adults. The CDC finds one out of three adults, 65 or older, falls each year. That accounts for nearly two and a half million visits to the emergency room. Uh, doctor, you wrote on a post this week on Forbes that having a conversation with a patient is, is a very important way to, to curb this. Absolutely. How does that work? Well, first of all, it's, it's having the conversation. A lot of uh, doctors and patients don't even begin with that conversation because falls represent a very significant cause of problems, injuries uh, that lead patients to come to the hospital. Uh, every day we see people falling. And this can lead to devastating injuries like head injuries, skull fractures, hip fractures. In fact, hip fractures are one of the biggest problems that lead to d immobility and then p potentially later putting patients into assisted care, living. And so it's, it's a large, large problem in this country. Are they slipping? Are they carrying too much? What, what's causing all these falls? Right. Well, really, picking up where, where, Rob, where Rob left off, you know, a recent CDC report found that the number of unintentional falls that result in death now in Americans over age 65 has doubled since just the year 2000. So that's really fast. Uh, there's not a single cause for this. I think a lot of it has to do with the aging of the population. So we're seeing more neurologic illnesses that right. cause falls, things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Uh, there's the older population has more vision and hearing loss and I don't think our environments have caught up with the safety measures we yeah. need right there's yeah. people that are still living with stairs without guardrails I think some of those things also have to change. Rob is there anything in particular you can do to prevent falls? I think first of all knowing what the issues are in the home and having the conversation again with someone who takes care of, of, of the person who's older yeah. and knowing what we can do to prevent them uh, these falls rather um, having guardrails like Holly's mentioning mm -hmm. or in the bathroom a lot of falls occur in the bathroom. People that um, take certain kinds of medications that lower their blood pressure can predispose them to falls. So again, having the protective devices in there. Um, also focusing on other things like protective shoe wear. Uh, footing is very key in terms of you know, having a good step, looking where you're stepping. Uh, people fall because of poor vision in addition to poor footwear. Millions of Americans will deal with more sweltering temperatures this weekend, so officials are urging everyone to take extra precaution in the heat this summer. Is there a particular group? I feel like we always hear it's the oldest right. and it's the youngest. Are those the groups? It typically is. It's people that are older, that aren't keeping up with their fluids, that are often are, are taking medications that put them at risk, again, for lowering their blood pressure. Um, we also see patients who have a history of psychiatric illness, people with migraines. These medicines reduce their ability to sweat, and because of that, they can overheat very easily. 
So, Holly, what do we do? I mean, I don't know if you can beat the heat, but what do you do at least to, to deal with it? Well, just as Robert mentioned, it, it's fluids. Hydration is the single most important thing you can do. If it's very hot out, try to drink between two and four cups of water every hour, whether or not you're thirsty. Yeah. If you don't have AC, make sure you're staying in the lowest floor of your house, ideally with a fan. If you're going to exercise outside, don't do it between 11 and 4, really the hottest hours. And, you know, head to the library, head to a bookstore, head to a grocery store, any place that has air conditioning if you feel like you're getting overheated. As an ER physician, I imagine you see a lot of uh, problems associated with just these staggering temperatures. We do. We also see people with other injuries, too. I, for example, people that use their grill in, in, you know, in, this, in this time of year, lots of injuries like burns. Sometimes uh, when they're scrubbing the grill itself, uh, spikes can be left over uh, and then embed in the meat. And so there are, so, are injuries that happen because... Uh, when they swallow the meat, they can injure their uh, in internal organs, uh, their esophagus. Also, we're seeing injuries from uh, pruning, gardening, lots of lacerations or cuts. Mm -hmm. So we have to think about these as well, not just heat-related injuries. It makes summer sound so dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, next time you find yourself craving a donut or a pastry, blame your nose. New research suggests when people unconsciously smell a sweet or fatty odor, like a fresh-baked chocolate croissant, they're more likely to decide to eat high-calorie desserts. This is not new science to me because every time I pass a Cinnabon and that scent is pouring out. Oh, it's the pretzels for me, the right. salt and all. Yeah, that's my, my only issue with this study is it can't, it can't explain my salt cravings, right? What about yeah. my pizza and yeah. fries here? All right. all right, Dr. Holly Phillips and Dr. Robert Gladder, thanks so much for being with us.